I saw the guy in the doorway. He said, if you start to make noise, I will cut your throat. A cool search. University of Wisconsin student Audrey Seeler is reported missing. Nobody has seen her in more than 24 hours. Friends had found the door of her off-campus apartment wide open, with no sign of the sophomore anywhere. She didn't take her purse. She didn't take her coat. She just sort of took off. At her apartment, police find her computer on, her cell phone left behind. We went uh, in every room of uh, the apartment building at Regent. We needed to, you know, share something with us. If you've seen her, if you if you know anything, if you've had contact with her in the you know, last several months, call us. But after an exhaustive search, investigators come away empty-handed. No one has seen or heard anything unusual in the building. Detectives search for a lead on the apartment's seven surveillance cameras. At first, they're disappointed. The video quality on two of the cameras is too poor to make out. Then, after scanning hours of video, they make a shocking discovery. It is Audrey Sealer leaving the building at 2.36 in the morning. You see Audrey come to the door and then she turns around and then she comes back to the door and she looks out. Almost like she's looking out for somebody, at somebody. We're also looking for anybody that's in that camera in that time span before, after, and with her that could potentially be a suspect. And maybe there was somebody in the parking lot that, you know, was threatening in some manner. The thought was, did somebody call her out? Had she been told to go meet someone? As investigators delve into the missing student's life, they make an alarming discovery. Someone may be after Audrey. Earlier in the semester, she was assaulted. There was a prior incident involving Audrey Sealer in which she was struck in the head while walking home from a party a couple of months earlier, and that that was an active investigation, and that they were still looking for a suspect in that case. At the time, Audrey couldn't give us any information about what the suspect looked like, no details uh, of anything for us to go on. At that point, it sort of raised the flag for me that maybe this isn't just a woman who's distraught or run away or gone back home, but that there was some crazy person out in our community who'd been stalking her and stalking her for a couple of months. Police launch a massive search effort. The college campus is surrounded by thousands of acres of woods, marsh, and lakes. Audrey's attacker may have taken her there, but by now, searchers fear they may be looking for a body. Some of the people who were going to be going out on boats today, when I say some of the people, I'm talking about Dane County Sheriff's investigators. I said, they've got a sense she might be in the lake. And so let's go out with them. I said, I've, I got a feeling that if she's, if she's still around, she's, she may be dead. With every passing hour, the search party continues to grow. At our peak of this investigation, the police department alone were over, just over 100 officers that were dedicated to it. And that does not include other law enforcement personnel from outside jurisdiction. Okay, we just finished coming through this white area and we need to uh, split the whole group up on this line. Audrey's close-knit family arrives from Rockford, Minnesota. Hundreds of friends and neighbors also stream into town to help in the search. Audrey Sealer was so well-loved in Rockford, Minnesota, and it's one of those small towns that I think you do everything for your neighbor that you can, even if it means driving to another state, staying at a motel, and going out day after day looking. I'll go tell them where I want them to search next, and I'll be back to talk to you. It didn't matter whether they were older, middle-aged, students from high school or at the college age. They knew each other, and it was a collective brain. I went out to go with the searchers, and her brother is leading the way, organizing and, and taking these people through the woods. Audrey's whole family is... Audrey's father, Keith, refuses to give up until his daughter is found. At some point, 
every parent wants to get out there and do something. And Keith came with us on one of the search parties and he trudged through some of the most terrible areas that we had to go through. And at one point he was up to his waist in muck and reeds. Investigators turned to Audrey's cell phone records for new leads. Looking for any unusual calls, they once again come up empty. She spoke to a friend at 7.58 p.m. Then, an hour before she disappeared, a call came in, but it went straight to voicemail. Taking a cell phone and going through that, you know, finding out who the calls were in the last half hour, hour that she was reported missing, those are key. But it's a call from earlier in the afternoon that raises suspicion. Audrey had called for a tow truck to jumpstart her car. The investigators learn that the driver has a long rap sheet for petty crime and is wanted for violating his parole. Anytime that uh, we found any little link or any open door, we were shoving people through it with a tow truck driver. We hunted that person down and, and we sat down and chatted with them. Again, every person that had contact that we knew of or we learned of, um, we sent people on them. But his other service calls place him far from Audrey's apartment at two in the morning. She has now been missing for over two days. You take it step by step, not draw any conclusions at the beginning. Let the case direct you to the end and it will take care of itself. With no obvious suspects, police initiate a check of known local sex offenders. Not too far from the Regent Street apartments, there is a residence that has um, sex offenders and some probation and parole residents. Any time in the city when we have an investigation and we don't have a lot to go on and it's in the proximity of a house like that, it's one of the things we definitely focus on. Detectives first check the whereabouts of some 40 halfway house residents. Everyone is accounted for on the night of Audrey's disappearance. But there may be trouble even closer to home, as detectives turn up a disturbing new lead. A sex offender named Kenneth Struley lives in Audrey's building, and now he's a prime suspect. The history shows that, you know, offenders a lot of time are repeat offenders and will continue to be repeat offenders. Was Struley the last person to see Audrey Sealer alive? He said, we're going now. You have to be quiet or I'll cut you up. I thought about what to do to get away, but I was too scared to come up with a plan. Audrey Sealer, uh, she seemed to be the all-American girl who had a bright future in front of her, who had never gotten into trouble, wasn't into a lot of drinking or drugs. Audrey appeared to be a very likable girl, very attractive woman, well accomplished, good in athletics, good in academics. Who wouldn't like her? Investigators finally have a suspect in the disappearance of Audrey Sealer. A known sex offender named Kenneth Struley lives in her building. Struley has a long history of assaulting children. We do the consistency over and over again as far as interviewing and, and making sure that he doesn't forget anything or he doesn't trip up somewhere and say something that he's been, you know, trying to hold in and cover up. But Struley's alibi is airtight. He was at work when Audrey disappeared. With investigators back to square one, the town of Madison, Wisconsin is on edge. If we have 10 murders a year, that's a lot of homicides. We don't have a lot of homicides in the city of Madison. We certainly don't have kidnappings. Madison has one of the lowest crime rates around. I can't remember the last time anyone was ever kidnapped, uh, much less someone on campus. Earlier in the school year, a student had been abducted from another Midwestern college town. That case sounds eerily similar to Audrey's. 
the law enforcement officials continue to be resolute in our commitment to find Drew Shadeen and bring her home. Drew Shadeen had been abducted and killed by a crazy person west of us uh, just within a month, couple months prior to the Audrey Sealer case. So this was something that was uh, a hot topic already nationally and locally we had talked about the Drew Shadeen case. Wisconsin police fear that they may have a copycat killer in their midst. There was a sense, based upon the information that we had, that there was a suspect out there that had abducted someone. And any time you get what is believed to be a stranger that has abducted someone, it heightens the fear in the community. But maybe it's not a stranger after all. Detectives learned from friends that in the days before Audrey's disappearance, she and her boyfriend, Ryan, had been fighting. Obviously, Ryan had a very key piece of this. He was definitely a focus. We needed to make sure that this guy, you know, didn't do something with Audrey, that didn't harm her, didn't, you know, take her body and, and dump her in the lake or in a, in a dumpster somewhere. During their interview, Ryan comes across as unemotional and seems unconcerned about Audrey's welfare. When we sit down with somebody, it's not about just asking the questions. It's not just about where were you, what are you doing? The nonverbal part is such a key in our investigation when we talk to people. That's almost as important, if not more important, than what the person actually says. The bread and butter of our business is what we do with our hunches. A hunch should not be the conclusion. If you draw conclusions to where this case should end, psychologically you have to ask yourself, do you start to fill in the pieces to make your conclusion come true. But there's no history of violence in their relationship, and Ryan can prove he was in his dorm the night Audrey vanished. The boyfriend is ruled out as a suspect. Another day goes by, and detectives are no closer to finding Audrey Sealer. We have to stay focused. We have to stay on that path of our investigation and what, you know, we are um, sworn to do. You know, we're going to turn over every every piece of evidence and we're going to look at everything. You have to keep your eye on the prize, if you will. It was tremendous pressure to go with what people thought. Tremendous pressure. And the pressure is about to get worse. Three days after Audrey's disappearance, reporters from all over the country are converging on Madison clamoring for answers. It was front page, top of the fold, every day in the newspapers. It was the lead story on all the television stations. It was the top story on the commercial radio broadcast. We are back. We're talking about Audrey Sealer. It all started with the University of Wisconsin. The disappearance of University of Wisconsin. 20-year-old Audrey Sealer. This the country really held captive. And since then, many more questions than answers. It was... Frenzy, complete and total chaos. Politicians are lucky if they can get that much coverage. With the national media now focused on Madison, the police chief holds a series of press conferences. We did not have time on our side. The media was expecting answers. I mean, not only were they expecting answers, but it increased, I believe, the expectations on the part of the community. There were updates all the time. Well, good afternoon. I, this is really getting to be a habit here. The Madison Police Department is investigating the reported sequence of events. We do not have the luxury of being able to speculate. We are continuing forward with this investigation. And you could read it on the, the face of our acting police chief, Noble Ray. I mean, he was, this was burning him. I know him well enough to know when he's burning inside, and he was burning at times when he had to step up in front of those microphones again. Good afternoon. I'd like to just make a brief statement before turning it over to uh, Captain Udacy. Our heart goes out, out to the family and friends of Audrey Sealer, and we're hoping and working towards a safe return. But as the case continues to unfold without a lead, it seems less and less likely that this story will have a happy ending. It was a short time after that that I'd gone down to the police department and uh, had checked in to see where the search parties were, the people from Rockford, Minnesota, and that's when I saw Audrey's father sitting outside the police department, and I had met him before, but I shook his hand again, and I said, I'm thinking of your daughter, and I, I hope for the best. With little hard information available, the media can only speculate. I initially thought she committed suicide, and we'd find her 
in a marsh, we'd find her somewhere in a car, we'd find her dead somewhere. Some people had talked to friends who said she was somewhat of a drama queen. So that helped buttress these theories that maybe she wasn't abducted, maybe she just disappeared. In the back of my mind, and I think in the back of a lot of those who were investigating the case, they didn't, no one I don't think thought that Audrey Sealer would be found alive. That she'd either been abducted and killed by some wacko, or she'd taken her own life for some reason. But just as the missing sophomore seems lost forever, investigators get a tip that turns the whole case upside down. He said, you stay down there or I'll use this gun because I do not have to worry about the noise anymore. Police know the chances of finding the missing woman alive after four days are incredibly slim. All week long, we've got the police scanners going in our vehicles and we're hearing potential sightings of Audrey Sealer. If you see a, a, a young Caucasian female with long brown hair, if you were walking alone, chances are somebody might think you're Audrey Sealer and call it in. Again, that's the type of community Madison is. They, people want to help. You know, anything that had any substance to it, we took a look at. Then, investigators get a tip that seems more credible than the others. A city employee was out for a lunchtime stroll when she spotted a disoriented young woman hiding in a marshy area of a park, just two miles from Audrey's apartment. The woman from the Department of Revenue who had spotted Audrey Sealer and had even spoken with her, and that Audrey had told her that she came there to relax or hang out. At that point, I thought, this is it. We sent a team to go through the park and, and, and search a park just to make sure that you no know, one was there. At that very moment, the police radio, a voice comes over and says, I've got her. It was the, the dispatchers from the, the communication center. It is Audrey that we have located. I just got a condition report. Officers find Audrey on the ground in a fetal position. They help her to her feet, but she's too weak to stand by herself. And she's reluctant to go with police. She claims that if she leaves the park, her abductor will kill her. We've got her, she's alive. She says she's been abducted. There's a guy with a gun and a knife. Her parents and some family members had been staying at a hotel just across from the marsh, so they were quickly on the scene. Cold and exhausted, Audrey is placed in an ambulance and rushed to the hospital. Then, out of nowhere, what sounds like gunshots ring out. Police fear Tapper is still out there, armed and dangerous. So now we're dealing with a situation where we have a barricaded person in this marsh area. And to send our officers in that, in that situation, knowing that there's, there's potentially a man in there with a weapon, this is really dangerous. SWAT teams surround the area. Choppers with infrared cameras search from above as officers scramble to set up a perimeter around the park. I mean, it was incredible. I had never seen in Madison this type of police presence and manhunt that was launching on live TV. And at this point, it's such an active search, they just need the help of uh, as many law enforcement officers as they can to sort of uh, uh, circle this area and make sure the person doesn't get out of this area. This is live pictures now. We now have uh, sharpshooters approaching the area, obviously wearing uh, fatigues. They have just arrived on the scene and obviously carrying some heavy artillery there. Meanwhile, hordes of reporters take shelter in a nearby hotel while more law enforcement moves in. They surround the marsh with squad cars and police officers. They lock the hotel down, keep us in there. And so now we're watching all of this unfold on television in the hotel lobby. This side picture is from the ground. The story has been uh, developing for the last two hours. So it was just a very surreal event to see that all happen. And there's helicopters and there's police officers with, with rifles. A police officer came running into the hotel lobby from outside, screaming to get out of the way. 
But as this guy comes screaming and running in, I think people thought like the shooter was coming into the hotel lobby. Police search for hours, but come up empty. We didn't find anyone. Uh, no one was there. So after that happened, and she's saying he's in there, you know, one, we're thinking, okay, did he get away before we got there? Madison seems to breathe a collective sigh of relief with her safe return. Later that day, hospital authorities hold a news conference. Audrey is dehydrated, but in otherwise good health. There is no evidence of sexual assault. She's really gotten through her ordeal remarkably well physically. Audrey was overjoyed to return back to us, um, just relieved, glad to be warm, um, to see her friends and family. And you, you can't, we just can't tell you how good this makes us feel. And to all of you for helping all of these efforts. At the hospital, police document Audrey's physical condition. Even the smallest scratch could end up being a clue. I actually saw her in the hospital. Uh, I briefly uh, poked my head into the, the room when uh, she was in there, and um, she was a little, it seemed like she was a little disoriented. She tells police an intruder entered her off-campus apartment at about two in the morning. She says she'd been studying by herself when a man dressed all in black entered through the unlocked door. I saw the guy in the doorway. He said, if you start to make a noise, I'll cut your throat. He ordered her to do as he said, or he'd kill her. The man said, I'm gonna watch you walk out of here. You won't be able to get away. He met her in the parking lot and forced her into a dark blue or black vehicle. He made many turns. I thought he did this to confuse me. Then we stopped. She says that after forcing her into the woods, he made her swallow cold medicine. She says they were in the woods overnight. I asked him, why are you doing this to me? He said, shut up, or maybe I should take the knife out. It was like he enjoyed having the power to scare me. It's just you and the captor. And they can deliberate, think about killing you, and don't. Obey or die. Yield, surrender, comply. Certain conditions apply to a situation like that where the person is rendered helpless. The captor uh, exhibits some small acts of kindness for example, feeding you, giving you a blanket, and letting you live. And this idea of letting you live creates a, a bond of interdependence between the captor and the captive. Investigators find evidence corroborating Audrey's story in the woods, including pieces of duct tape and a box of cold medication. Using a metal detector to sweep the area, they also recover a kitchen knife with a serrated blade, just like the one Audrey says her abductor used. Madison is in a state of fear. A dangerous man is still in their midst. We continue to urge the community to remain vigilant by taking normal safety precautions, such as never walking alone, utilizing safe rides, locking your doors, and being aware of your surroundings. When the police found me, I told them, we have to be careful because he's right over there. But right now, we're just focusing on being together and holding each other and hugging each other. <laughs> there is jubilation in Madison, Wisconsin, when Audrey Sealer is found in a park near her apartment. Police question her for most of the day. There is a, a supportive environment that you definitely want to create for a victim. And so the task of the detectives uh, working this case was a complex one. 
said, shut up. And she tells her story, and, and then they, um, they go back over it again, like, just tell us again what happened, you know. Tell us what happened, okay. A half hour later, okay, tell us again. Tell us again what happened in that day. Maybe there's things that change a little in the story that, that we're looking for that is key. But Audrey's account doesn't waver. She works with police to come up with a likeness. Phil Yonke, the police officer who drew that sketch, when he showed it to her, she didn't really have much of a reaction to it, which he thought, he's done a lot of sketches, he thought that was pretty unusual for her not to have some type of reaction to that sketch. It also seems strange to detectives that Audrey's description is so vague. If you spent this much time with this person, come on, you gotta have a little more detail. Did he smell? Did he have a scar? Though police are starting to question Audrey's story, they decide to go public with the sketch. And at that given time, we're going, is this the right time? Should we provide this composite? Do we have enough information to overrule putting out this composite? We will never take the chance of uh, ignoring something or disclaiming it, it's not true. We're talking about people's lives and livelihood and the, the safety of the community, it's just, it's just too risky. At this point in time, we have, uh, we had a missing person investigation and we have a suspect in relation to that missing person. We have received a description of a suspect who was described as a white male in his late 20s to early 30s, 5'11", 6 feet, last wearing a black sweatshirt and jeans with a black cap. But not everyone in the press is buying the official police story. Do more than they were telling, because I think they were afraid of having egg on their face. A very prominent agency doing its hardest and best to investigate a very difficult case, a case that's in the national spotlight. The police were walking a very fine line. They had their suspicions that this was not uh, an abduction. But they weren't 100% sure that it wasn't an abduction. The detectives they're walking this one forward with a victim, but also keeping in mind that they could potentially have what ends up being a person that's charged. Investigators take a closer look at Audrey's appearance at the time of her rescue. According to the initial police report, Audrey's clothes were dry, even though there had been recent rain. Her fingernails were perfectly clean. There was no sign of a struggle anywhere on her body. Anybody who's gone camping would know your clothes are going to get dirty if you're sleeping out in the woods or you're going to get cut on some brambles or you're going to have, you know, some things clinging to your clothes. I mean, she just didn't have the appearance of someone who'd spent several days out in the elements. The more Audrey Sealer insists she's telling detectives the truth, the more they think she's lying. There's information starting to suggest inconsistencies in the information that she was providing. Uh, once the detectives have that information, then it's a matter of how do we present this information to get at the truth. They continue to press her. Audrey starts to falter, first saying, I, then correcting herself to say, we. At one point, she even claimed she was abducted in the park instead of her apartment. I had gotten a call from a police source and I thought he had said to me, I want to let you know this is off the record. And I thought he said, she's wet. And I said, well, of course she's wet. She's been in the marsh. And he said, no, I didn't say she's wet. I said, she's whacked. We think she's 1096, but you can't use that. I said, what's going on out here? He says, we have to check out her story. We're going to write it out as long as it takes. But I want you to know on background and off the record that we think her story may not hold up. Investigators search Audrey's laptop computer for more clues. Using forensic software, they retrieve the contents of the hard drive, accessing every keystroke. Recent visits on websites, your emails, any activity that was on that computer. People think that you can go in and delete stuff, you know, delete stuff off your computer and um, clear out all your files and it's gone. It's not gone, it's on your computer. Someone had checking out weather, what was going to be like in the week she was missing, and they were also checking out area parks. 
the weather that time of year, spring, can be dicey, so I'm sure someone who's think, thinking of being out in the elements wants to know what it's like. So we were sitting in the chief's office talking to the parents, and Audrey's mother said something to the effect of, well, you know, Audrey doesn't do anything unless it's really well planned out. Investigators confront Audrey. If you have a law enforcement official standing at your door questioning about things and then presenting you with evidence that contradicts what you said, yeah, you're going to be you're going to be trying to find another angle, another way to to validate what you're saying or validate what happened. But Audrey doesn't flinch, and psychologists believe they know why. Well, she's lying to protect. I think she's lying to protect her story. I do not get a sense that she was toying with them at all. For us, it may be, I better stick to this story because I don't want to go to jail. For her, it will be, how can I get them to believe what's really going on for me? How can I get them to see that the best outcome is for them to be able to help me to keep this reality alive? But then, detectives track down a pivotal piece of evidence. A security camera at a nearby department store has caught Audrey on video the day before her disappearance. It clearly shows Audrey buying cold medication, a package of rope, a knife, and duct tape. I'm sure when they got that videotape from the store that had the abduction kit, that's an aha for investigators. We got her. Investigators also have the store receipts proving that Audrey made the purchases. Which is very damaging evidence. That was a critical piece of the investigation once we got that. I went there to buy gum and chapstick. That's all I can remember. Now, investigators know she's lying. But I'm sure they said to her, look, these are the items that we have you purchasing that are found on your person when you say you were abducted and that the abductor left these items. We know that's not true. Now what do you want to tell us? They just chipped away at the store by little until her intellect kicked in and she saw that there was no way out. Finally, she breaks down. It just got so out of hand. I did not mean for it to. Everybody did so much for me. I didn't mean to lie. I'm so sorry. For those of you who just may be joining us... We now know that she went to the store and in a very calculating, very measured way, bought duct tape and a knife, presumably to um, cover her story. Anger and frustration sweep through town as the people of Madison learn that they've been duped. Audrey's disappearance has been solved. But why she did it remains a mystery. Detectives dig for answers on Audrey's hard drive. Just three days before she disappeared, detectives discover that Audrey's computer had accessed her boyfriend Ryan's email account. They Audrey found romantic notes that Ryan had exchanged with another girl. One of her greatest fears in her life would be a fear of abandonment. A boyfriend turning his back on you is the ultimate abandonment. Sure, students break up time, and sure, people have trouble all the time, but when you have someone like Audrey in a situation that she was facing, she probably didn't have the coping skills to deal with it like the average person would. Investigators theorize that Audrey became so distraught and irrational that she devised the hoax to get her boyfriend back. It would be more than enough to bring her to this point. So this was a response for her to be able to hold on to people that she loved. The public was very angry at first. If you gauge their opinion by what you hear on local talk radio. Let me just sum up the typical Madison do-gooder approach to this whole pathetic situation. Could you do that That for is us? Andre Seeler. It's a $97,000 uh, cost uh, for the for, for that uh, time period that, was, that, that the taxpayers hit on. Uh, the people would question why, why are we spending that, that kind of money? Most people in Madison wanted charges. And not only because they are the ones paying the tax dollars that support the police department that looked for Audrey. I think a lot of people also wanted a message to be sent to others who would claim a crime was committed when there never was. Within days of her recovery, Audrey and her family assembled a team of high-powered lawyers to begin negotiations with the district attorney. The defense painted this portrait of a young girl who was confused, clinically depressed. She was on medication. It's not a violation of, uh, of either civil 
statutes or, or, the, or, the, or the criminal statutes in the state of Wisconsin to leave your apartment at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's also not against the law to go buy duct tape or, uh, or, uh, or, or, or other kind of paraphernalia and ropes and stuff like that. There's nothing I know of that creates any violation of law in doing that. The defense stresses that she was never in trouble with the law before. The strategy uh, that Randy carried out was to get information to the prosecutor about Audrey Sealer, about her family, about her circumstances without overdoing it, without overplaying the hand. But the defense attorneys had a major problem to deal with, her statements. Each time that a person says something to a Wisconsin law enforcement officer that is untrue, that's a separate potential charge of obstructing an officer. It's fair to say that had those interrogations not taken place, she may never have been in a, a position where she could have been charged. We'll take a few more calls on this uh, before moving on. One charge is brought against Sealer for apparently changing at least part of her story. Should we at least charge her with a misdemeanor? The state charges Audrey with two misdemeanor counts of obstructing police. She faces up to 18 months in jail and a $20,000 fine. The people of Madison eagerly await Audrey's court date. It was so quick and so fast to go from this very serious situation where everyone was worried in the community to a situation where there was anger. People were wondering how they were duped. Then there was a cry for her to be punished. Then there was also people feeling, feeling sorry for her. Three months after her disappearance, Audrey Sealer appears in court. I don't think a Dane County courtroom has ever been so crowded for any trial. A murder trial doesn't garner that much attention. Everyone wanted to see Audrey Sealer. Certainly Audrey, but to a degree her lawyers felt a certain sense of apprehension because you, you can't ever fully predict where a court will come out. She is not in court today because she was depressed. She was, she's in court because she thought only of herself and her desires at every step of the way. Prosecutors said this was someone who was narcissistic. She was concerned with herself, loss of a boyfriend, and wanted attention. I've always loved helping those close to me with things that upset them, but never wanted to burden others with my problems because I could always figure things out. This time, however, I wasn't able to quite figure out what was bothering me or why I couldn't make myself feel better. But I'm more sorry than I can ever say for causing worry and cost and effort that could have gone elsewhere. I'm taking care of myself now so that one day people can see that I'm still a girl to be proud of and someone you would want as a friend. Audrey pleads guilty to two counts of obstructing police. The judge sentences Audrey to three years probation, a $9,000 fine, and 250 hours of community service. As a condition of her plea, she must also undergo mental health counseling. The 20-year-old former UW student entered guilty pleas this morning to two counts of obstructing police. It was completely clear to the detectives who interviewed Ms. Sealer that she was not disoriented as to time, place, or reality. But really, I think she was very much into the whole process of the abduction. And I think she believed it. The court may have provided some legal closure, but there will always be questions about the episode that upended a college town. I think if it were to happen again, I think the national media would be back here again. 20-year-old Audrey Sealer is the country really held captive. And by since then, many more questions than answers. To this day, there's still mystery over Audrey Sealer. We really still don't know exactly what happened to her or exactly why. For those of you who just may be joining us... We now know that she went to the store and bought duct tape and a knife to um, cover her story. It just got so out of hand. I did not mean for it to. I didn't mean to lie. 